Here. He has had not only a professorship experience, but also extensive administrative experience. Uh, 33 years, essentially, of uh, professorship so far, and uh, about 10 or over 10 years of administrative all the way to the uh, deanship of the uh, College of Chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. He's known in the area of catalysis uh, very much so for his uh, pr primary interest in developing correlations between structure and activity in catalysts, as well as other catalytic properties. And in his, for his use of in situ uh, spectroscopic techniques, and more recently for his use of theoretical techniques as well to aid in the development of understanding between relationship between uh, structure and, and properties. He's the recipient of numerous awards. You can read about those in the afternoon. Again, I think it's not mentioned here that most recently he received the ACS award in 2001 for innovative homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, catalysis. I think the word is innovative, is that right? Creative. Okay, <laughs> okay. so it's close enough. Close. <laughs> um, again, widely uh, published. His interests, he's had a wide variety of interests throughout his uh, long career. Uh, more recently, <coughs> In, uh, the er in the area of conversion of uh, alkanes and uh, other uh, hydrocarbons through oxidative uh, processes. <coughs> and today he's going to speak to us about um, the uh, relationship between structural properties and Professor uh, Thanks, Raul. <coughs> well, I hope to uh, keep you all awake and animated during this period right after lunch. It's uh, always tough to be a speaker right after a, a nice uh, lunch, but I'll do my best here. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this spring symposium for inviting me. It's my first opportunity to come to this part of the country and uh, see it, although briefly, and uh, to have a chance to meet with you and uh, learn about the research activities here in the field of catalysis. So what I'm going to do is to give you overview of some of the activities in our group from the past several years. If you allow me to get this off. <coughs> Give you an overview of some of the activities in our group over the last several years in this area of doing mechanistic studies with the aim of learning something about how this all relates to the performance of catalysts and what's the relationship between the structure and the performance. And we'll see how this evolves as we move <coughs> now, the first question that uh, we can ask, and in fact, uh, some of my colleagues even ask, is why bother? Why study reaction mechanisms? What do you hope to learn uh, from this? And I've identified here three areas in which we hope to learn. We want to develop a basic understanding of how reactants are transformed to products and how this relates to reaction kinetics. <coughs> and we want to identify where are the limitations what are the bottlenecks that prevent us from getting either higher activity or better selectivity from a catalyst? And then ultimately, how is this all related to the structure and composition of the catalyst? And uh, if we understand that, then we might have a basis for making some rational uh, choices in terms of improvement. Now, the thing I wanted to ask is, uh, okay, if you're committed to doing this, what is it that you need to know? And again, there are several uh, elements that one would like to uh, pursue here. Uh, for example, you'd like to know about the structure and coverage of absorbed species. This includes reactants, intermediates, products. What's the connectivity between the absorbed species? If you see actors on a stage, how do you know who's communicating with whom? And where's the message being passed to? And finally, what are the dynamics of these elementary processes, and how does that relate to the overall performance of the catalyst? Now, to pursue these questions, it's necessary to 
have some tools, <clears throat> and I identify them here. So spectroscopy plays a big role, particularly if you can do the spectroscopy under reaction conditions so that you can see the dynamics and the identities of the actors who are on the stage. Uh, isotopic labeling and tracing techniques help us to find how the chemistry progresses from the reactants to the final products. And increasingly, what we're finding is the theoretical techniques allow us to validate or to test hypotheses that come out of the experimental studies and see whether certain things that we propose are reasonable or not. So in recent years, quantum theory in particular is becoming a, uh, yet another tool in the ensemble of tools used in such investigations. <clears throat> now, I thought what I, what I would do here is to carry this theme about reaction mechanisms and how this relates to structure property relationships by showing you four illustrations. One on Fischer trope synthesis of uh, paraffins and olefins from CO and hydrogen. We've already heard some about this today, and you'll have another talk on the subject tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk next about a so called green chemical, dimethyl carbonate, which can be made from methanol and CO2 over zirconia. Next, the problem in air pollution control, the abatement of NO using methane over a cobalt ZSM5 catalyst. And then finally, <clears throat> I'll talk about some recent work on the oxidative dehydrogenation of propane to propene over vanadia-based catalysts, where the idea is that you'd like to make olefins from alkanes in a selective fashion. So let's uh, look at the first of these uh, four examples. And in each case, I'm going to give you a little bit of motivation and background before we launch into the details. The basic idea in fischer tropsch synthesis is that you take synthesis gas, principally CO and hydrogen, and convert it into a homologous series of paraffins and olefins. And I'm just illustrating that here with the stoichiometry on this line. And the reason you want to do this is to make, for example, very high cetane, sulfur-free, diesel fuels, and there are a few plants around the world that are doing this already today. Uh, the catalysts for this are typically iron carbides, cobalt metal, or ruthenium. And of course, what we want out of all of this is high activity and high selectivity. Now, the issue that I want to bring out here is what is the process, or what, are, what is the chemistry by which these two small molecules are transformed into this homologous series of hydrocarbons. And this is certainly not a new topic. It's uh, one that's had <coughs> a considerable amount of effort devoted to it. And there have been competing mechanisms. But the one that survives today, and the one which has the greatest amount of experimental support, is the so-called carbene mechanism that suggests that CO is absorbed first as a molecule from the gas phase. It then dissociates to produce nascent carbon and oxygen. The oxygen is quickly removed with hydrogen to make water. And the carbon then undergoes a series of hydrogenations to make first the methine, methylene, and finally a methyl unit over here. And in particular, the methylene and the methyl units are key intermediates for starting a chain propagation uh, process. And you can see this here. If I take methyl, and add a methylene unit to it, I'll make an ethyl unit, which can then be terminated either to make ethane or ethene. And if I continue doing this, I can make a homologous series of hydrocarbons with increasingly higher number of carbon atoms in the chain. And the critical steps here are the rate coefficient for dissociation, the conversion of the monomer into the chain initiator, the termination here, in this case to make methane or to make the alkanes and olefins, and of course the propagation rate, uh, which is shown over here. And so what we want to look for are the presence of the species that are proposed over here, for example, methylene, methyl units, the alkyl units that are shown, uh, shown over here. And also, we'd like to look for and identify the rate coefficients for these elementary processes. So how do we go about this? 
Well, we've used a variety of in situ and near in situ techniques to find all of the actors that are involved in fissure trove synthesis. So, for example, on ruthenium, we have seen molecular CO by in situ infrared spectroscopy. It occupies about 80% of the surface and is characterized by a single band at 1900 wave numbers. We've seen the presence of atomic carbon by carbon NMR with a shift here of 400 ppm. We have found the monomer unit, methylene, by using what's called reactive scavenging with olefins. We take an olefin <coughs> such as a perfluorinated cyclohexene and react it, uh, put it in with the syngas. And what we discover is that we can fish out of the complex spectrum of products a cyclohexane ring, still decorated with all the fluorines on it. But bridging that at one point is the CH2 unit. It makes a molecule called norcorane. And this is certainly not a product of fissiotrope synthesis and can only be produced by coupling that uh, fluorinated olefin to the, uh, uh, the methylene unit over here. Alkyl units can be seen by infrared spectroscopy, by MR spectroscopy, and transferred to olefins uh, as alkyl cyclohexanes and cyclohexenes uh, and by reactive scavenging. So the point is that all of the things that have been identified on paper as candidates uh, for the mechanism of fischer tropsch can be found experimentally. Now the question is, how Excuse are me, these? You didn't, you let me interrupt. Yeah, yeah please do You don't see any uh, ruthenium methyl, methyl ruthenium groups there? Methyl? The methyl groups. Yeah, yeah, we see them too. They're, they're in this uh, uh, class here. When, uh, when you, when you uh, get down to n equals zero and you drop the CH2 group, you can see those. Yeah, at the very onset. What happens in both NMR and uh, infrared is that you can see the methyl groups first and then the others grow in and that masks the methyl, because they all have vibrations or shifts in the same range. So it's, it's hard to see them uh, when they're all together. So the question is how are all these species related? And for this what we've done is uh, a series of isotopic tracing experiments. The basic idea is that you feed unlabeled carbon monoxide, or C12 carbon monoxide, with deuterium. And the, re the use of deuterium versus hydrogen is, is a, a technical uh, issue here dealing with mass spectrometry, which I won't get into. But we then substitute uh, into the feed C13 labeled CO and deuterium, same gas composition. And what we do is follow the transients in C12 and C13 labeled hydrocarbons to see how the C13 label propagates into the product stream. And then we calculate the fraction of any product containing N carbon atoms that is labeled with C13 as a function of time. And what we're going to do is come back and use a theoretical model to simulate the, uh, uh, this function as a function of time. And from that, identify the coverages by uh, adsorbed species and also the rate coefficients. And the experimental conditions under which everything is done is shown here, or shown here. Now, as you might imagine, to get the fractional labeling of products with carbon-13 is not a simple process. And so what we had to do was develop our own analytical scheme for this. And I illustrate it here, because it's, uh, it is unique. We take the effluent from the reactor, which is changing in terms of its carbon labeling fraction as a function of time. I'll move out of your way, buddy. Uh, and trap it into one of 16 sample loops over here. And the sample, uh, sampling system is driven by a computer. So at a pre-specified time, every few seconds, we grab a sample and store these samples in a, uh, in a furnace. And then at an appropriate time, we take each sample and send it to this gas chromatograph that has a capillary column in it. And out of that then comes the ordinary uh, FID response, which we record on the computer. And that gives you this blue trace over here, which is the FID <coughs> response, an ordinary chromatogram of all the products. But as each of these products elutes, we split off a part of it so that not all of it goes through the uh, flame ionization detector. The rest gets blended with a stream of oxygen and helium, 
And that pulse of hydrocarbon goes into a glass capillary within which we've very carefully threaded an even finer platinum wire. Uh, and this uh, whole ensemble is then heated to 400 C. It becomes a little microcatalytic reactor. And what we do is combust that pulse of hydrocarbon to CO2. So you have a chemical amplifier built in here because for each N uh, carbon atoms that you have in the uh, uh, molecule, you get one molecule of CO2. So as you go down through the product spectrum and you have smaller and smaller concentrations of the high molecular weight hydrocarbons, you're amplifying them by the number of carbon atoms that you have in there. And that pulse then comes out and goes into a mass spectrometer it is constantly shuttling between mass 45 and mass 44. So it's looking at the labeled and unlabeled CO2 as it comes out. And you log that on your computer as a function of time, and then you get the red and the green traces. The red trace is the carbon-13 labeled CO2. The green trace is the C12 labeled CO2. And as a function of time, these do opposite things. They're mirror images of each other. And if you co-add the, or add together these two uh, spectra, you can reproduce the FID over here. So we have internal consistency. So by this means, we're able to look at the fractional labeling as a function of time and generate transients that look like the following. So this is the fraction of any carbon number that contains C13 as a function of time. And notice that the time scale here is of the order of two minutes, 120 seconds, thereabouts. And for the light hydrocarbons, you can't very much distinguish the traces. They all look more or less the same. But as you get out to C5, 6, 7, 8, and onwards, you can begin to differentiate the traces one from the other. There's a progressive lag uh, reflecting the fact that you have to add more and more carbon atoms to get out that far. Uh, before you terminate the chain and release it into the gas phase. The curves that are shown on here are the result of our simulations. And so you can see that we can simulate and capture these dynamics very nicely. The question is, how do we do this? Well, we start with a model that is based on our proposed mechanism. And the model that we try to capture in terms of mathematics is shown over here. That's what I call a compartment model. <clears throat> now let me lead you through it since it's a bit complex. So from the gas phase in equilibrium with the surface, we have adsorbed CO. And we know experimentally that that um, the dynamic is very fast, and therefore equilibrium is the appropriate assumption. Then rate limiting is the dissociation of CO to produce nascent carbon, which is very quickly converted uh, under our assumption into the monomeric methylene, or monomer unit which then can add one more hydrogen and make the methyl unit. And then the methylene unit can add to the methyl and make ethyl, and then add to the ethyl to make propyl, and so forth down the line. So following from left to right from here on out, we're making progressively higher molecular weight alkyl groups, feeding always from the monomer pool. At any one of these alkyl points over here, we can desorb into a fizzysorbed layer, and then out into the gas phase, and then be reabsorbed. Or we can return from the fizzysorbed layer and make the corresponding alkyl by reacting with a hydrogen atom on the surface. We have to say that we're assuming here that termination is purely to olefins. So the only products in the gas stream are olefins, which is consistent with our experimental observations in this case. So here's the scheme. And for each compartment, there's a time constant, which is identified by tau in a particular subscript. And these time constants, which are shown over here, are in turn related to the um, rate coefficients and the coverages that go back to the details of the chemistry. So what we're going to do is to write a set of differential equations. They're, they're very simple, as you'll see in just a moment, that are dependent upon these tau values. Fit the responses that we get from these differential equations uh, to values of tau, and then from this set and the coverages. So that's the, uh, the scheme. And I'm not going to uh, belabor the mathematics. There's a fair amount here. I just want to illustrate the results. And as I said, the differential equations governing the uh, processes here are very simple. It's a nested set of first order 
ordinary differential <coughs> equations in which the coefficients that are the adjustables here are these time constants that are being uh, shown here. And because of the nature of these um, the differential equations, they can be solved very readily by Laplace transform in closed form. So you have a closed form solution for the set of differential equations. You go into an algorithm for fitting the responses to the experimental results. You back out the values of tau. And then from that, deduce the or calculate the corresponding values of the rate coefficients and the coverages. And that's the part that I want to show you. So here are examples for just one set of reaction conditions. We've done this for many different conditions. So at the top of the plot are the rate coefficients for propagation, termination, and initiation. And I show that they are essentially independent of the space time or the residence time of the reactants in the reactor, which is good news. They should be independent. Uh, on a different plot, we also show that they are independent of carbon number, which they should be. So that's a test um, uh, validity of the modeling. And the point here is to look at the values. Uh, propagation occurs roughly at the rate of one per second. That's uh, relatively slow. Termination happens even more slowly, one every two-tenths of a second per second. Uh, the activation energies are 8 kilocalories for propagation and 20 for termination, which says that as you raise the temperature, this rate coefficient is going to go up more rapidly than that. And consistent with that, your alpha value, or the probability for chain propagation, goes down, exactly what is observed experimentally. The rate of conversion of the, uh, uh, the uh, CO, adsorbed CO, into, uh, sorry, the, uh, the monomer into uh, the uh, alkyl here, methyl group, is even slower. It's uh, of order several hundredths, maybe eight hundredths of a reciprocal uh, second. Now on the bottom are the surface coverages by uh, methyl groups, ethyl groups, all alkyls, and by methylene. Groups. And you see the dominant species on the surface is methylene groups, consistent with what we see by NMR. The sum of all of these species is of order a few tenths of a monolayer, consistent with what we can measure independently by temperature programmed uh, reaction. And so what we feel is that we're getting out of this analysis a set of coverages which are uh, not only the correct values for the, for the uh, modeling, but are also consistent with observation. Now, at the bottom, I show you something else. And that's the rate coefficient for the uh, dissociation of CO, which is the rate limiting step in the scheme. And this turns out to be 3 hundredths of a reciprocal second under the conditions that we have done these experiments. And those are shown over here. So that's for this process here. Uh, so, excuse me. Yeah. Up till now, everything is independent of regime, right? Uh, everything is for this particular catalyst of ruthenium. This will be valid for any catalyst. No. no where, where does that work out come in? What? This, this particular step? No, all these calculations. Oh, uh, because the responses that you get, if I change the catalyst, I'll get a different set of responses. So for example, if I do this for cobalt on titania, I'll get a different set of dynamics under the same set of uh, conditions. And I, I actually just received a thesis from Holland a few months ago where this had been done. And uh, the numbers come out, uh, they're diff slightly different from these, but they're in the same order of magnitude. So it is very much dependent on the catalyst. Um, and uh, that comes out uh, from the fact that the experimental dynamics will be different. But let me point out that this rate coefficient here is the, is the critical one. And what we want to ask is, what could we do to enhance this process? Because if we enhance this process, everything else goes faster. One question on uh, the K. Yeah. Is KP so low because it's a, it's a whole function of many, many steps? No, it's, it, that's for adding each methylene unit independent of how long the chain is. And by the way, you know, uh, <coughs> since you're with Exxon, I'll mention that Chuck Mims, who used to be with Exxon, uh, did similar things while he was at Exxon, came out with similar numbers. So by independent uh, set of experiments. So there are about three or four groups that have measured these rate coefficients. They all come out with about well, the I same numbers. Not that, I just was wondering. Oh, why is it so low? Uh, 
Well, it's a combination. Okay, if you try to explain it on a more fundamental basis, it's a, it's a combination of the uh, pre-exponential factor and the activation energy being what it is, what they are for that particular system. Um, you know, and you can go then down to you know why is that the case, and that has to get into the bonding that you have on the surface of these species. Let me move ahead with this theme of uh, how you might uh, alter the uh, behavior to get a higher degree of dissociation. We looked at this uh, quite extensively and finally concluded that a lot of it hinges on the structure of the catalyst. So here <coughs> is an illustration. This is an a, a atomic resolution micrograph of a ruthenium particle sitting in contact with titanium. And you can tell that this is ruthenium by either doing selected area diffraction or just actually measuring the spacing between the rows of ruthenium atoms. Uh, here, notice the marker. This is uh, 20 angstroms or 2 nanometers. So the 2.2 spacing here, angstrom spacing between these lines is corresponding to ruthenium. And over here, we have a particle of anatase. And in between is an amorphous layer of titania that partially encapsulates this ruthenium particle. Uh, by changing temperature, we can actually move the degree of encapsulation. Here you can see complete encapsulation of a similar uh, particle. But we can also do the following. We can chemisorb hydrogen on this <coughs> catalyst and differentiate between the hydrogen that is sitting on the ruthenium, marked in red, and the hydrogen sitting on the titanium, marked in green because the chemical shift in NMR of these two hydrogens is distinguishable. And so together with uh, Terry King, when he was at uh, Iowa State, we made these measurements as a function of how much titania we had available here. We actually doped a ruthenium on silica catalyst with titanium. I'll show that to you in just a moment. And by this means, we could measure the amount of free area and correspondingly the amount of ruthenium that is covered up by the amorphous titania. Now, why is all of this relevant? It's relevant because this affects the activity and performance in many ways of this ruthenium catalyst. So I'll show you on the top panel that if we look at the turnover uh, frequency for CO consumption and at the same for methane generation as a function of the fraction of the ruthenium surface that's covered up by titanium, we see that we can tune the activity over a factor of two, more like a factor of two and a half to three, by adjusting the titanium coverage. And it maximizes at a coverage of about a half. And correspondingly, we can dial down the amount of methane that we make. So here's an example of being able to have a knob where you actually change the behavior of the catalyst. Notice also that it does one other thing that's desirable in the bottom panel. As we increase the titanium coverage, we increase the value of alpha. And this is the probability for chain growth, which you'd like to have high because you'd like to make as many waxy material, as much waxy material as possible, which you could then hydrocrack into the diesel uh, range. So we have a knob which adjusts the activity and selectivity. But it doesn't tell us why this is happening. And what I want to turn to is, uh, in particular, why does the activity increase the way we observe? So to pursue this further, um, I worked on a project together with my colleague, Dvor Samarjai, in chemistry, where we could use some of the techniques of surface science. And so what we did is to take a rhodium foil now, mounted on a pair of wires so that we could heat it uh, electrically, resistively, and then we vapor deposited submodelayer quantities of titania onto this rhodium to simulate the partial uh, coverage of the metal by titanium. And what I'm showing you here on the left is the relative rate of forming methane from a mixture of hydrogen and CO under these conditions over here as a function of the coverage of the surface by titania and by a number of other metal oxides. Here's titania, here's tantala, etc. And you'll see that in every case, with the exception of alumina, there is this kind of domed behavior, which maximizes at about half a mile layer. 
just what we saw with the ruthenium on titanium cathodes. The only exception is alumina, which shows no synergy between the uh, oxide and the metal. And here, all we do is mask off the metal, and the activity drops to zero in a linear fashion. So there's something magical with these other oxides, or something different, not, certainly not magic. The question is, why is the activity so much higher than it is on the clean surface? And so what we hypothesize is that at the alineation between the oxide and the metal, there are exposed Lewis acid centers, Ti3+, Ti4+, the metal cation of the oxide, that can interact with the Lewis basic center of CO, which at the same time is bound to the metal surface through the carbon atom. And so you have this Lewis acid base interaction over here. Now, if this is correct, then the stronger we make the Lewis acid, the more we should tug on the oxygen end, and the easier it should be to break the carbon-oxygen bond. And so we looked for a measure of Lewis acidity. Well, you read the inorganic text, and you discover that one of the best is the Pauling electronegativity, chi sub i here. And that's given by the intrinsic electronegativity of the element times 1 plus 2 times the charge on the uh, element. So we took Pauling's numbers for chi zero. We measured the charge by XPS by uh, looking at, after reaction at what is the uh, average oxidation state of the metal of the oxide and putting that number in. And what I show you are the data here. Uh, on the horizontal scale is the maximum amplification relative to one of the rate due to the oxide at half a model layer coverage. And you can see that even though there is a fair amount of scatter, there is nevertheless a trend line here telling us that you get greater enhancement with greater Lewis acidity. And that Lewis acidity is helping you break this carbon-oxygen bond, and that in turn is giving you the higher activity. And lo and behold, metals like titanium and tantala here come out uh, near the top of the heap. And in fact, that's been seen with support catalysts as well. And today, uh, most of the commercial, or virtually all of the commercial catalysts that, that are uh, described in the patent literature use titanium one way or another as a promoter, albeit not with ruthenium or rhodium, it's with cobalt. So the bottom line here in this first example is that all of the intermediates that uh, have been hypothesized in the literature for fissure trope synthesis have been identified by these um, techniques, infrared spectroscopy, NMR, or reactive scavenging. The isotopic tracing has proven very useful in identifying dynamics of chain initiation, propagation, and termination. And then finally, we've discovered that metal oxides, which contain strong Lewis acidic promoters, can increase the rate of FTS by facilitating the association of the carbon-oxygen bond, a critical step in getting the whole process uh, started. Well, let's turn uh, used to make polycarbonates. And in that process, you avoid using phosgene, another bad actor which we'd like to get away from. Uh, a third possibility is to substitute <coughs> methyl tertiary butyl ether with DMC. Uh, it has much lower toxicity, is biodegradable, and uh, has characteristics in terms of suppressing uh, um, the pollution emissions that are similar to that of MTBE. So for all these interests, there's an interest, there's uh, increased enhanced awareness of the DMC and a desire to make it in novel ways. And one possible approach is to take methanol, combine it with CO2, make dimethyl carbonate and water as the counter product. And very recently, work in Japan by Fujimoto and his collaborators has shown that this could be done with zirconia and modified zirconias. So we were curious as to how this chemistry occurs. So the first question is, what's, uh, what are the active centers on zirconia? Well, it turns out that there are three distinct active centers on zirconia. And as I'll show you, all three of them get involved in chemistry. So here's a bird's eye view, or a molecule's eye view, of the top surface of monoclinic zirconia. And you have three kinds of groups there. You have hydroxyl groups, such as these triply bridged hydroxyl groups. Here's the proton attached to an oxygen, which is shared with three zirconium atoms. You also have these isolated hydroxyl groups over here. 
You then have Lewis acid base pairs, which involve a zirconium 4 plus and an oxygen 2 minus. And those are shown here, green and blue. And over here, green and blue. They come in adjacent pairs across the surface. So you have Lewis acid base acidity. You have hydroxyl groups. And on zirconia, these are amphoteric, meaning they can either act as Bronsted acids or Bronsted bases, depending on whether they're challenged by a strong acid or a strong base. So the question is, how do these species interact with CO2 and with methanol? Well, it turns out that in this case, um, nature is uh, uh, kind to us and allows us to investigate these uh, processes at relatively low temperatures and on a time scale that's very convenient for us in the laboratory. So one of the first things we looked at was how methanol interacts with monoclinic zirconia. And you can observe this from several different perspectives. You can look at the disappearance of the hydroxyl groups by looking in the stretching region there, 3,700 wave numbers, and see the disappearance of hydroxyl groups, both isolated and triply bridged hydroxyl groups, and the concurrent appearance of vibrations associated with the bending modes of a methoxide group that are being formed. And just to show that these are symmetric in terms of the dynamics, here is the, di here are the dynamics of disappearance of the hydroxyl groups. Here are the dynamics of the appearance of the methoxide. And you can see that these are basically mirror images of each other. So what's going on? What we propose is that the methanol comes in and with its oxygen end, which is Lewis basic, interacts with the Lewis acid, zirconia. But the hydrogen atom here, which is slightly acidic, interacts with this mildly basic hydroxyl group on the zirconia, releasing water and giving you a methoxide. And another variant of that is shown over here, although we think this is the, probably the, the most correct way to draw that uh, chemistry. So the point is that both the Lewis acid and the Bronsted basic site are involved in activating methanol to make the methoxide. Now, once you have the methoxide in place, you can introduce CO2 and watch what happens there. So, again, the bottom spectrum with these peaks over here are characteristic of the methoxide. We now introduce CO2, and within seconds, we see a series, there are actually five very intense bands grow, which can all be identified with a species known as methyl carbonate. It's this species over here. You go in the literature and you look up the spectra for potassium, uh, zinc, lead, uh, methyl carbonate. There are a number of these that have been published. Uh, the positions of our lines are virtually identical to those uh, of uh, this zirconium uh, methyl carbonate. So the question is, how does this happen? And by the way, look at the d dynamics over here. The uh, dynamics of the disappearance of the methoxide mirror the dynamics of the appearance of the methyl carbonate. So it's, again, a one-to-one -one, uh, kind of reaction. So what's going on? What we uh, envision, in this case, actually, this is the picture I prefer, is that the CO2 comes in. And again, it's Lewis basic oxygen interacts with the Lewis acid center on the zirconia. <coughs> But the carbon, which is slightly Lewis acidic, interacts with the basic oxygen. And what you get here is an insertion reaction in which the CO2 inserts into the methoxide oxygen zirconium bond to give you uh, the methyl carbonate over here. And it turns out that there is one known precedent uh, for this kind of chemistry from Mingus's group in Canada, uh, albeit not with zirconia, it's with magnesium and calcium uh, complexes uh, down at this end. So that's the chemistry. And the way that this all comes together to make dimethyl carbonate is shown over here. So we start at the left on the top here with the scheme to make the methoxide. Having made the methoxide, we insert CO2 to make the methyl carbonate. That's again here. The second molecule of methanol comes in. And this time, the oxygen of the uh, zirconium oxygen bond to the methyl carbonate interacts with the methyl group at the same time that the oxygen of the methanol is interacting with the zirconium. So we have two Lewis acid base interaction occurring simultaneously. And this time, the net effect is to transfer a methyl group to the 
methyl carbonate, releasing DMC and restoring the hydroxyl group. So we have a complete catalytic cycle here. And the point is that all three types of uh, species or centers on the zirconia are active in the chemistry. The Lewis acid base pairs and the Bronsted basic uh, groups, uh, which uh, together with the Lewis acid are involved in activating methanol. And we've pushed this one step further. Uh, we've said, well, gee, if uh, 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 all of these species are important, and we know that if we go to tetragonal zirconia, we're going to get weaker centers, both Bronsted and Lewis acid base centers, what would happen? Will the chemistry be slower? And in fact, that's exactly what happens. The chemistry is an order of magnitude slower on the tetragonal phase of zirconia, same surface area, as it is versus monoclinic. So this is uh, how you learn about this kind of uh, chemistry. Uh, third example, and again, completely different system. We're going to talk about NO reduction by methane. So this is a problem in air pollution control for stationary sources. And it's been shown by John Armour and his colleagues at uh, Air Products and a number of other groups, including our own, that uh, cobalt ZSM5 is a very active system for this reaction, even in the presence of oxygen. And what we've learned from magnetic susceptibility and ESR measurements is that the cobalt does not undergo reduction or oxidation. It stays in its 2 plus state. So the mechanistic issues are, does NO react directly, or is it first converted to NO2? Is methane adsorbed? And how are N2 and CO2 formed? And these are the issues which we've addressed by doing in situ spectroscopy. So let's look first at what kind of nitric oxide species or nitrogen oxygen species we have on this catalyst. So we take our cobalt ZSM5 catalyst, which we've prepared, expose it to uh, nearly 4,000 ppm of oxygen and 5% oxygen. And uh, what we find is we get a mixture of mononitrosyl cobalt and dinitrosyl species, these two peaks over here. And when we introduce the oxygen, we quickly form species in this nit nitrate and nitrate, 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 nitrate and nitrate uh, region, which I'm outlining over here. And as we raise the temperature, the nitrosyls desorb, and the nitrites and nitrates slowly decompose. And what we're going to do is carry out a similar temperature programmed reaction uh, experiment, except now we're going to add methane and watch what happens. And what's curious is that a lot of the chemistry stays exactly the same. So all the lines relating to nitrosyl are identical to what we had before. In other words, if you only looked at that portion of the spectrum, you wouldn't know methane was present. But if you look at the portion of the spectrum that is related to the nitrites and nitrates, when methane is present, those bands are less intense. I've sketched in here in red the intensity of the bands that you would have seen in the absence of methane. And at this point, the black and the red would have been coincident. And so you can see a disappearance of intensity in the region of the nitrite and nitrate, indicating that those are the species which react with methane. At higher temperature, we also see these two peaks outlined in blue over here. And it turns out that these are intermediates. So let's look and see if we amplify that region, what we have there. These two bands, which we originally called A and B, could be identified by working with various isotopically labeled gases. So here's the garden variety NO methane mixture. Here's NO labeled with N15. Here's uh, carbon C13 labeled methane. And you notice that the band shift depending on which labels we have. And working with this database then we, and, and the literature, we could finally identify band A as an isocyanate associated with the aluminum in the framework of the zeolite, whereas band B is associated with a cyanide group associated with cobalt. And it's, as I'll show you here in a moment, it turns out that band B is really the intermediate. A is a spectator. 
B reacts very rapidly in the presence of oxidizing species to produce nitrogen and CO2. <coughs> the question is, how do we know this? We know this because we can do an experiment like this. We can prepare the cyanide on the catalyst by reacting methane and uh, uh, NO. <coughs> and then we can expose that species to a small amount of NO2. And with a mass spectrometer, follow the dynamics. And we see the only two products are nitrogen and CO2 in one-to-one -one correspondence, dynamically and integral form over here. And that's exactly the stoichiometry that you would expect if you took one molecule of NO2, one molecule of CN, and uh, looked at the products. And here are the rate, apparent rate coefficients, first order rate coefficients, which we calculate. They're essentially the same. And they're in the same order of magnitude as that determined from the infrared. It's harder to do this from the infrared. That's why we, we don't have the certainty here. But they're certainly faster than the dynamics of the NCO species, which is basically a spectator. So distilling all of these facts together, what we conclude is that we have a mechanism that looks like the following. Cobalt cations are sitting in charge exchange positions on the zeolite. They chemisorb NO to make a mononitrosyl, which we can see spectroscopically, then a second one to make the dinitrosyl. Interact with oxygen to produce NO2 and a uh, NO2 bound species. This process we can also observe uh, spectroscopically. The NO2 then it reacts with methane to release water and make the CH2NO, which unfortunately we have not been able to see, so this is a hypothesized species. But it's known from the chemical literature, from the organometallic literature, that this species is not stable and will readily decompose to shed water and produce a cyanide. So this chemistry here is quite plausible. The cyanide, which we do see, reacts rapidly with NO2 or with O2, particularly with NO2 to make the products N2 and CO2 and restores the cobalt. So this is the way we piece together this kind of catalytic cycle. What it tells us is that the important actor here is the cobalt 2 plus because it chemisorbs the NO. It holds on to it at elevated enough temperature that we can convert the NO into NO2. And that's the species that we need to react with methane in order to ultimately make nitrogen and CO2. Alex, before you leave that, is there any, any possible evidence that maybe you go through an isocyanide cyanide that flips around to give the cyanide bonded species? Yeah, that would, have a different, uh, that would have a different, that would have a slightly different stretch, so that the assignment is more consistent with a cyanide versus an isocyanide, but chemically... But that's the, the most stable form, I'm wondering yeah. if the intermediate on the way oh, is Oh, that I don't, that I don't know, that I can't tell. Yeah, I, that I can't tell. Okay, yeah. We're, to, to even see this is a challenge, because these are present in small concentrations of 400 C. But it's possible. <coughs> so, um, let's move on then to the last example, which deals with the oxidative dehydrogenation of propane to propene. And here, the uh, literature teaches us that of the various things that have been tried, the best catalysts all contain vanadium in one form or another. But what isn't, is not so obvious is what are the structural requirements for that vanadium? What kind of an environment should it be finding itself to operate properly? So the key issues are identification of the active site for oxidative dehydrogenation, determination of the reaction mechanism, and what factors affect the alkene uh, and alkane combustion. I'm only going to deal with the first two of these three uh, items here. So let's look at what these catalysts, uh, how these catalysts are produced. That's summarized here. Uh, we've used various supports, although one that we're fond of because it disperses uh, zircon uh, vanadia very nicely is zirconia. So we'll produce a high surface area zirconia with lots of hydroxyl groups. We'll then take ammonium vanadate, put it in water, adjust the pH, we get the groups that look like this, which will then graft on to the hydroxyl groups on the support. And then once we dry and calcine, we get a spectrum of species ranging from isolated vanadyl, polyvanadates, to small particles of B205. 
And how do we know we have all of this? Well, one way is to look at uh, Raman spectroscopy, which highlights these species, these, and these. They all have distinctive uh, uh, Raman spectra. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, there is a consistent shift in the edge of the UV visible spectrum. Uh, the coverage of the surface we can actually measure by doing CO2 titration and, and telling that initially up to about 60% of a monolayer of the support coverage we're putting down just monovanadyl uh, groups here, monovanadate groups, and then we got the polyvanadate, and as we approach one monolayer we start getting little crystallites of B205. Now, since I want to talk more about the mechanism and less about structural characterization, I'll only show you one transparency relating to physical characterization. And this has to do with the edge of the UV visible spectrum. That band edge energy, measured here in units of electron volts, shifts in a very consistent fashion, going downwards in magnitude as we put more and more vanadium on the surface, expressed in, group, in units of VOX per square nanometer, ranging from 0.1 to 100 on the scale. And notice that this band edge energy falls and is, lies between the limits for a, an isolated vanadyl orthosilicate tertiary butoxide, a molecule that my colleague Don Tilly and one of his graduate students have synthesized and characterized, and has a band edge energy of about 4.5 eV, and at the other extreme is V205 that has a band edge energy just below 2.5 eV. So we go between one extreme and the other as we spread out this, uh, or put on more and more vanadium, which tells us that we're making larger and larger domains. So how does this relate to catalysis? <clears throat> on the left-hand side of this transparency, I show you a plot of the propene ODH turnover frequency as a function of domain size, or plotted in this direction is the absorption edge energy. We're using that as the metric for domain size. And you'll see that within the scatter, there's this envelope, triangular envelope, that points upwards and says that as I make the domains larger, the activity per vanadium increases, and the max corresponds when we have a monolayer or just the top surface of V205. The two are indistinguishable. So what this tells us is that we want larger domains. Why? What is it that this absorption edge energy tells us? Well, it turns out that having a low absorption edge energy indicates that it's easy to transfer an electron from the oxygen to this vanadium center. This is a reductive process. And that's the first step in getting these oxygens on the vanadyl groups to react and activate the, uh, uh, the propane. It also turns out as we move from this direction to this one, it's easier and easier chemically to reduce the species with hydrogen. We've done that independently. So the picture that emerges for the chemistry is the one that is shown here on the next transparency. Here's the mechanism that we propose on the left-hand side. Propane comes in, finds two adjacent oxygen species, and we'll talk about what these are in just a moment, it makes a, 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 a propoxide and a hydroxide. The propoxide then sheds another hydrogen atom to make propene and hydroxyl. The hydroxyls recombine to make water, leaving behind an oxygen and a vacancy. And the vacancies are refilled by dissociative chemisorption of oxygen. Now you'll notice that on the scheme, I've shown reactions 1, 2, and 4 as being irreversible. How do we know that? Well, we've put in mixtures of C3H8, C3D8, and asked, is there any communication between these? If there would be, we would see some scrambling in the propane. And there is none. So we know that this is an irreversible uh, uh, process over here. Likewise, if we put in labeled propene, uh, we see scrambling between the propenes, but not back with the propane. Likewise, if we take O216, O218 mixtures, we don't make any O16, O18 O dioxygen. So the uh, dissociative uh, chemisorption here is irreversible. On the other hand, if we take D2O and H2O, they scramble to equilibrium. So we know which processes are equilibrated and which are not. 
You put it all together, you get a rate expression that looks like this. It's first order in propane and inverse order in this complex expression here involving water and a mild dependence on propane and oxygen. Uh, what this measures down here are the relative surface coverages by oxygen, the species over here, and by hydroxyl groups, the species over here. As you put in more and more water, you inhibit the reaction, and the surface now becomes dominated to a greater and greater degree by hydroxyl versus oxygen atoms. When you do that, you also pick up some additional sensitivity to the propane and oxygen concentrations, which are absent if no water is in the system. And what I show you on the parity plot on the right is that this rate expression does a near perfect job of describing the experimentally observed rates on both this monolayer covered zirconia, uh, 10 weight percent vanadium zirconia, that's equivalent to about a monolayer, and on the surface of bulk V205. Those are the green triangles over here. So we seem to have gotten both the mechanism and the kinetics uh, essentially uh, right here. But we still don't know where the oxygen is that's reacting. So to pursue that, we undertook some quantum theory. And we decided to simulate a chunk of the top surface, the one, uh, 010 surface of V205. So here again is a molecule, molecule's eye view of that surface. And it sees three types of oxygen. The vanadyl oxygens, which are doubly bonded to the uh, vanadium. These bridging oxygens, which are bonded to two vanadium atoms. And these O3 oxygens that are bonded to one, two, three vanadiums. They're all distinct. So the first thing we ask is, what is the nucleophilicity? How, how loving of protons are these oxygens. And one way to investigate this is to calculate the Fukui function, which measures nucleophilicity of different oxygen species. When you map that out in color, you discover that the most nucleophilic oxygens are these over here. Next would be O2, and third would be O3. So now you present propane to this surface, and you find that the best way for activating the propane, the lowest energy pathway, is for the methylene carbon to present itself to one of the oxygens in a vanadyl group. This is not a side on view. Uh, there's a simultaneous bond formed to one of the hydrogens from the protein. Uh, in the transition state, that hydrogen starts to migrate over to the next oxygen group over here. And this vanadyl group is bending in to meet it. This one is bending over also to hand off the, the proton. So this is the transition state, the first order saddle point. And what you're left with, then, is a hydroxyl group and an isopropoxide. Now, you can do the same uh, calculation, assuming that you were attacking the methyl group, and you find that that's uphill energetically, both in terms of activation energy and overall energy of reaction. And so there's a preference to go isopropoxide versus normal propoxide, which is of order 16 at 600 K, which is uh, roughly what we see experimentally. Now, further validation for this uh, attack at the methylene unit comes from isotopic labeling. And in this case, what we've done is to label with deuterium various carbons in the propane. So if we go and we label differentially the methylene unit, hydrogen versus deuterium, but keep the outer carbons as methyl, then you see a kinetic isotope effect of 2.7. And the same if we were to label differently all of the carbon atoms or all of the hydrogen atoms. But if we keep the central carbon atom deuterium labeled and we differentially label the exterior methyl groups, we have no kinetic isotope effect, which is then consistent with the quantum chemistry and also consistent with the uh, bond energies that you would just look up in a table uh, for uh, the methylene carbon hydrogen bond versus the methyl carbon hydrogen bond. As you go up in temperature, though, this kinetic isotope uh, drops from 2.7 down towards 1, because now uh, you're starting to attack the methyl groups to a greater and greater degree. And that's consistent, again, with the quantum chemistry. So the bottom line here is that the, on this last example, is that the kinetics of oxidative dehydrogenation on uh, 
vanadium surfaces are well described by what's called the Mars Van Prevlen redox mechanism. Uh, the proposed reaction mechanism is supported by both the isotopic tracer studies and the quantum chemical studies and the uh, kinetics that are deduced from the proposed mechanism. Now, the last thing I wanted to say in concluding this talk, as shown here, come back to the original theme, and that is that I've tried to show you that such mechanistic uh, studies provide valuable information about the elementary processes that occur on catalysts and how one goes from reactants to products. They enable us to identify what factors control activity and selectivity, and this is critical then to knowing how should we tinker in an intelligent fashion rather than a random fashion uh, with the structure and composition of the catalyst to make improvements. So let me end here by acknowledging those who did the work, and this is a, a truly international uh, group. Uh, Kamala Krishna and Takashi Komaya did the work on Fischer trope synthesis, as well as did Alex Baffa, Kyung Tech Jung. Uh, did the work on uh, the uh, uh, synthesis of DMC. Adam Ayler and Lisa Lobry worked on NO uh, reduction. Andrei Habakov and Kai Dong Chen worked on the oxidative of dehydrogenation of uh, uh, propane. And much of this work was done in collaboration with colleagues, Gabor Samarjai in chemistry, Jeff Reimer, Enrique Iglesia, Arup Chakraborty, all of whom are in chemical engineering. Uh, with the exception of the work on NO uh, reduction, everything I've told you was supported by the Basic Energy Sciences Division of DOE, and the balance was uh, supported by NSF and the Gas Research Institute. So with that, let me thank you once again for this invitation and this wonderful opportunity to come and visit you here. Multiplicity of sides required for this reaction. Do you see a dome shaped kind of dependence, or uh, is there a, again, kind of uh, the dependence kind of follows the band gap uh, type? Uh, yeah, okay. So, what we didn't plot, uh, we can only do this for zirconia where we can actually measure the coverage of vanadia quantitatively. Uh, we didn't plot the activity for those catalysts as a function of coverage. Uh, so I don't know the shape of that function. Besides which, I know that the data are noisy enough that we probably will have trouble telling you unambiguously what the shape is. So the best we can say is that you need multiple sites. But to deduce that <coughs> indirectly from the shape of this uh, plot that you're right. suggesting would be nice. We haven't done that. Yeah. It's accessible, but we'd have to redo these experiments more carefully. Yeah. Uh, of the systems that you study, do you think they're optimized? Do you think that... that Yeah, that's a good question. Well, let's see. Let's take them in order. In the fischer tropsch uh, system, uh, well, first of all, you're not going to use ruthenium for reasons of availability and also volatility of the oxide if you're trying to regenerate it in an oxidative uh, environment. But in terms of uh, using cobalt, which is what all well, the patents today are teaching us, uh, and the additives, yes, we're coming very close to optimal performance. Now, optimal has to be defined within the context of what kind of a reactor are you going to use. Is it going to be a fixed bed process? Is it going to be a slurry bubble column? If it's a slurry bubble column, who's bubble column? Uh, what kind of feed gas are you going to put in? And what kind of gasifier? And there's a tuning that goes on that you learn about in the patent literature uh, that involves all these issues. But uh, people understand a great deal about how to uh, tune uh, to get best performance for the reactor system that they're targeting. So this knowledge has fed into that direction. On uh, dimethyl carbonate, uh, we're in the early days of figuring out how to make that molecule from CO2 and methanol. 
oxidative carbonylation, CO2O2, over copper chloride catalysis, industrial technology, although it has its problems at the separation end. Um, so we're, we're still not sure. There's a recent paper by Fujimoto showing that ceria addition to zirconia, small amounts of ceria addition, give you a big boost. No clue as to why that's so. Okay. That's something we're investigating ourselves. Um, on the cobalt ZSM5, uh, the activity is almost what you need for uh, practical application. The stability is the problem. It is either the zeolite collapses with time, or deilluminates, or the cobalt migrates out, and nobody has resolved that issue. So that's not so much a catalysis issue as a catalyst stability issue. And let's see. Uh, the last one, oxidative dehydrogenation. The trick is to figure out how to keep propene from being burnt. And it turns out that there, what you would rather do uh, is put the vanadium on magnesia or another basic oxide and make a uh, magnesium vanadate, which we've done with my, one of my colleagues also. And there we're learning more and more about the kind of environment in which you want to put the vanadium to minimize propene combustion. That's, we're still learning. We're not quite there to be able to get a prescription. But that's an answer to okay. your question. Uh, I think we're first. Yeah. 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 Um, on the uh, reduction of NOx with methane, mm -hmm. you, you formed or you identify uh, a dinitrosal with cobalt. Right. You know, one possible mechanism is that you could form N2O on absorption. Did you see that? Because no. that is an issue. No. We see this with other systems. We see this with copper, for example, but not with cobalt. And not in, in the presence of O2. Yeah, we, we have, we're aware of that. Um, I would suppose that the uh, rate constants that you quote have to be regarded as true rate constants for a surface reaction. I just wonder, for any of these systems, do you see that the so-called compensation behavior for either of those four cases? Okay, well, let's see, there, there are several issues here. Uh, what is true, first of all? Uh, these are the rate, co in the case of the fischer tropsch synthesis, these are the rate coefficients that reproduce the kinetics. Are they true? Well, uh, they're true in the sense we think they're physically meaningful, that's the first thing we can say, because they're carbon number independent and independent of the space velocity of the feed, which is the first test. Are they true in the sense that uh, independent physical techniques of prediction would give you the same numbers? We don't know, because nobody has done that. So that is an open question. Uh, is there a compensation effect here? Well, uh, we also don't know, because we haven't chased these around uh, enough to, to know. I do know, though, from some theoretical studies that we've done, that the so-called compensation effect that appears in the literature may be more an artifice of how data are analyzed, an artifact of how data are analyzed, than a true chemical phenomenon. And it has to do on metals with the fact that when you study how um, uh, adsorbates get together, there is an influence of the local activation energy by whether I have no nearest neighbors, one, two, three, four, five, whatever number. If I don't account for that in the properly in the description of the, uh, the rates uh, and the, uh, the, the local clustering, which is non-statistical, uh, non uh, I will get artificially a, uh, uh, an enhancement in the pre-exponential factor. And that's been published on by a number of people, including ourselves. Let me ask a question myself. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, spectroscopy, I guess, advancement for mm -hmm. homogeneous catalysis, yep. I think you work on the uh, quantum side also uh, in relation to that. When you draw from biology analogy, the uh, dynamics is a very important part of the mechanism for understanding. When we do, and I guess you work, say, on the kinetics and the isotopic, you see that dynamic. However, when we come to do the spectroscopy and we come to do the modeling part, we always deal with the ground states and the non-dynamic uh, portion of the model. Where do you see all of that going? Okay, let, let me see if I can take that question apart. When you say the in biology you see the uh, dynamics, I think what you're saying is that you see dynamics 
in biological systems, the, uh, the enzyme substrate getting together the, the docking uh, part. You don't see, uh, because uh, biological systems work at essentially room temperature, you don't see excited states, electronically excited states. In catalysis, also, we don't work at that high a temperature in most cases that we would see electronically excited states. So yeah. it is appropriate to do quantum calculations from the ground state perspective. The critical thing is, do we get the transition states correctly by, by density functional techniques? And there, the uh, theoretical physicists uh, and theoretical chemists will tell you, maybe not. Uh, because in the transition state where bonds are really stretched to their limits and you're making new bonds, there's a lot of what's called electron correlation. And this is the part that density functional theory takes in by a kind of a, a you know, uh, ansatz, a b b building of a structure to account for it in the theory. It's not ab initio. And there is no real theoretical basis for putting in that functional. So there's some question as to whether we get that right and if we get it right to what accuracy. But it is appropriate to do ground state calculations uh, for catalytic uh, systems, as it is for biological systems. And the trick is that the, the uh, catalytic systems are actually simpler, involve fewer atoms, fewer cooperative effects than you have in <coughs> biological systems. Okay. Just thank you, Dean.